The second plenary talk is entitled The Future of Ice Design Innovation by Seha Sturja. Dr. Sturja is the CEO and chairman and also co-founder of Marvel. While remaining deeply involved in the daily challenges of running a global growth company, Dr. Sturja participates heavily in Marvel's engineering and marketing efforts across analog application processor and microprocessor design while offering inputs across all of the company's other product lines. Dr. Straja is an ITP fellow and holds MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley. He received a BS degree in electrical engineering from Iowa State University. Please join me and welcome Dr. Straja. All right, thank you, Professor Jeff. <clears throat> uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, it's an honor for me to be speaking in front of so many of analog and digital circuit design. Just as you, I too am passionate about this subject. In fact, the the first time I was standing in front of you was about in 1988 when I was presenting my pipeline A2D converters. That was about 20, that was like 27 years ago. That's exactly about half of my life. So you know, now you know, now you know how old I am, I am now. So, but today, actually I have some uh, thing more important to talk about. Uh, the first subject that I want to talk about is about this, the SOC that we, talk, uh, that we know of. Uh, SOC is in danger. We build our SOCs too complicated for our own good. Second, the more I look at it and, and to, uh, into this, uh, the, the, the things that we have, especially computer systems, our computer systems actually uh, is broken. Computer systems has stopped evolving many decades ago. Yes, we have Moore's Law. However, we can only do so much with Moore's Law. It is time for us to change and to build things differently. So let's start with the SOC challenge. Why are the days of SOCs numbered? First, after decades of increasing mass costs of more than 100% per generation, the cost of mass sets will soon surpass or reach, at least reach the $10 million mark. For those of us who can still afford to pay such an astronomical high cost of entry, we still face more challenges. For one thing, modern process nodes tend to be very complicated and often take several iterations to design our, our chips, especially if we integrate many of the analog functions. This causes the cost of developing many of new products in new generation nodes to be prohibitively expensive. So by the time we reach the 28 nanometer node, the steep rise in mass cost is finally taking a toll on our bottom line, including at Marvell. Many companies, in fact, went out of business before even they reached this point. To those of us, they are still in this business we are finding out the return of investment, financially at least, for the chips that we built in the 20 nanometers to be very low or at least, or even sometimes negative. Uh, the reason you do that is because often we, we don't have enough chips to sell in a given design. Yet for all the way we know, as you have seen from the previous speaker, not moving with Moore's law to 10 nanometer to seven nanometer, even possibly to five nanometer, is not a good marketing strategy either. Yet despite the recent consolidation of the semiconductor industry, we are actually seeing new players getting into the market. It's a disaster. Well, especially these are well-capitalized, vertically integrated system house 
such as Apple and Samsung, who had jumped into the bandwagon for their own internal consumption. This creates, obviously, lower volume opportunity for the rest of us. Now the question is, so what is the big deal anyway? We always have competitions in any business. Well, the problem is, with our SOC business, we make our SOCs so complicated, or what? Just because we can. We get carried away about our own bullshit, about needing to integrate everything into a single chip. The more we can integrate, the macho we think we are. For example, in the smartphone, uh, uh, smartphone business, we integrate not just the CPU and the GPU functionality, but also everything else, 3G, 4G modem, the broadcast video, 1080p, Quad HD, audio, audio HD, camera, GPS, and seemingly everything else except the kitchen sink. Meanwhile, in the smartphone market, is fickle and fragmented. The market change, the, the market is extremely dynamic, resulting in rapid changes in the requirement what needs to be integrated, yet the customer changes the mind even faster. In the meantime, design complexity and design cycles are increasing exponentially. As a result, our engineers, including myself, now we have to make decisions much earlier than we are used to. This is very uncomfortable. Even if we develop many chips in parallel to anticipate the market needs, there is no guarantee that the results will see the light of the day. Now, the solution to this challenge is actually is written in the PC book uh, PC uh, business. As you know, even after 30 years of talking about single chip PC, even the mighty Intel, the founder of Moore's Law, only integrates the GPU along with their CPU and leaves everything else to a handful of companion chips. So obviously, there's nothing unmacho about building a true mega system on a chip. At the end of the day, the consumers, you and I, do not make decision to buy a PC nor a smartphone because they are built using a single chip or not. But on the other hand, we are not suggesting for a minute that we are going to go back to build our SOCs the way like we build PCs, especially with the increased complexity and cost and power associated with the PCI interface that used in the PCs. Now, my proposal to solve the SOC challenge is what we call the modular chip concept. We name this Mochi. It is time to think about this integration. It is time that we build our chips similar how the Lego company built their Lego blocks. So conceptually, this is not rocket science. We just need to accept that the optimum integration is not necessarily the most complex, the biggest system of the chip, but rather a handful of simpler and somewhat highly integrated system on a chip building blocks. My proposal is to build mochis that could be easily tiled together to create virtual system on chips. Each mochi's building block, or in short mochi, will have the ability to talk to each other as if they are integrated in a single piece of silicon. Now, every mochi by design should have access to the common resources, such as DRAM, because we do not want to dupl duplicate expensive system resources. Mochi could be stacked together in any order seamlessly so that our customers do not okay, have to change their software. This is to ensure that our customers to be indifferent about getting a true mega system on a chip or a virtual Mochi system on a chip. Now, the financial benefits of Mochi should be clear. 
Many standard functions, such as peripheral functions, change very little over the years, or even not at all. These functions and other mixed signal functions should be built into what we call the non-compute, or more commonly known as the South Bridge uh, uh, mochis, preferably in older and cheaper process nodes. And eventually, we will use more advanced nodes when the process nodes become more mature. And we do that once and for all. That way, we can focus our resources on building the more compute-intensive uh, building blocks, mochi building blocks, in the much more advanced and expensive process nodes because these are the, the compute, the intensive building blocks are the ones that could truly benefit from scaling. Now, the key component of Mochi is clearly its interconnect technology. Just as the Lego company has to live with its choice of the Lego interface, we do have to live with our choice of Mochi interconnect for a very long time. Yet, we need to balance the needs of high bandwidth, low power, low cost, ease of PCB routing for today's requirements as for many years to come. So at the end, we chose Mochi based on AXI interface. But at the signaling layer, it is packetized and serialized using micro service technology. Now in SOC, we also have a lot of miscellaneous digital signalings, hundreds sometimes. And we need to still take care of that so we integrate those signal links as sideband uh, signals or packets of our Mochi interconnect so that we don't add any signal pin overhead. Mochi not only makes life easier for our chip designers, that was the original goal, but also will enable our customers to creatively build new systems. We design Mochi to be highly flexible with point-to-point -point parallel interfaces, shown at the bottom, or daisy chain serial connections to enable countless configurations of mochis. Now, we do have constraint. The only constraint is that memory-hungry mochi should be placed closest to the mochis that have the powerful memory interface functions built in into it. Uh, this usually the application processor mochi, the compute mochi that we talked about earlier. The rest could be daisy chain in a serial manner in any order, thus reducing the need for many parallel uh, mochi interconnects in the compute mochis and thus reducing the cost drastically. Uh, by using the micro service, we can build mochi south bridge devices in very small packages. Most can even fit in a size of four millimeter by four millimeter, very small package. Meanwhile, unburdened by the multiple variable functions, uh, the compute intensive mochis now can shrink considerably. As a result, the overall footprint of the uh, virtual system as, uh, as virtual SOC based on mochis could actually be smaller or at least equivalent of the true mega system on a chip. By the way, just because uh, 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 we use a service, it doesn't mean that we cannot address the highest end, higher end applications. By using Mochi interface, the micro service in parallel, we can actually increase the throughput considerably at very low cost. In fact, 10 of such micro series technology in 28 nanometer only occupy one square millimeter of silicon area. And of course, we only do that if it is necessary to do so. And often, we find out that it is not necessary. And finally, while at the transport layer, our base proposal is to use micro series technology, Mochi fundamentally also supports parallel digital signaling for application that needs much, much higher bandwidth through the use of multi-chip module or interposer 
technology. Infrastructure on, or, and uh, uh, communication networking applications are some of the examples they will use this choice. Now we have shown you the, the how to build the SOCs of the future, but we still have to solve the today's flawed computing system that I uh, hint, hinted to you earlier. I do not know about yours, but my computer needs eight gigabytes of DRAM to function reasonably well. Clearly, even if we could make our SOCs to be free, the cost of building a fully functional computer system was still very high because of the DRAM cost. So the question is, what in the hell we need so much DRAM anyway? The answer to this is actually right in front of our eyes. For those of you who have a habit of checking the PC task manager, and I did, I stared at this for years, you would notice most processes are idle, incredible, 0%. The only problem is, in aggregate, these idle processes actually takes a, take a lot of space, a lot of DRAM space, expensive spaces. So if you, this, this gives us a clue on how to solve this problem. So maybe it is possible to cache only the active processes in a much smaller DRAM and leave the inactive processes in a cheaper main memory. So this is how it should look like. Now the conventional DRAM main memory is replaced with a cheaper SSD main memory with a small DRAM cache attached in front of it. We call this memory a new memory uh, architecture, uh, SFLC, stands for final level cache. The billion dollar question is, how could such a small DRAM be effective as a cache? After all, a lot of people today have 16 gigabytes in their laptops. Wouldn't be the SSD too slow for, uh, to be effective? The answer may surprise you. Actually, only a fraction, a small percentage of an application code, any application code that we have seen, loaded into the main memory is actually active. If the non-active parts of an app these applications are not loaded to the main memory, nothing bad will really happen. The only problem is today's computing systems, in today's computing systems, the, the operating systems does not have an idea when to load or unload the, uh, these snippets of codes in these applications. Now, FLC solves this dilemma by automatically loading any code on an as needed basis, and more importantly, to purge the unneeded code when, like, don't, when no longer needed to free up space for other applications to get in. As a result, any application now takes a much smaller percentage of the FLC than otherwise indicated by the size of the application alone. This is the reason why we could drastically reduce the size of the DRAM in our FLC. This will save huge amount of money and power, energy. Smaller DRAM also means that we can build DRAMs to be way faster, or at least a little bit faster. Ultimate means we can build our computers to be faster. So what is unique about FLC anyway? First, since FLC is a cache, the DRAM is now virtually, instead, physically addressed. Well, this is the next one is very important. FLC cache is gigantic. The lines are not just gigantic, the cache lines of the FLC are gigantic as well. In fact, we chose 16 kilobytes. Yeah, we, can put, we can pick 8 kilobytes, we can pick 32 kilobytes, but 16 and more tends to, be, to work very well. In contrast, CPU cache line sizes are tiny, 64 bytes in modern computing systems. 
Now, most importantly, we chose fully set associative cash. We do this to minimize the cash collision among the multiple processes that could exist inside our FLC. In comparison, CPU cache sizes, cache architecture tends to be set associative with very limited number of sets, eight or 16 sets typically. One more thing, final level cache is not last level cache. Last level cache used in P CPU is part of CPU. Final level cache is actually, has nothing to do with CPU, is part of memory. FLC advantages be obvious. System using FLC could now use at least 10x smaller VRAM, and we can now make our computer to be way cheaper. Much smaller VRAMs also means much longer operating and standby time for our mobile devices. More impressively, we could now afford to put our computing, not just our hands, our, our phones, our computers, into complete deep sleep since we could instantly wake our computer up on demand as we only need to bring in only the necessary relevant processes or part of the relevant processes back into FLC and not everything else that used to be in FLC. Uh, FLC full, fully set associative cache and large cache line technology is superior compared to traditional CPU cache. Uh, to prove this, uh, we will show you it miss, uh, miss rates on various mobile and compute benchmarks. An example, and the first one shown here is the Antutu uh, benchmark. Uh, as you know, the Antutu benchmark is the standard benchmark used uh, to stress the performance of multi-core CPU and the memory subsystem of your mobile devices. As you can see, FLC miss rate is practically zero, even for the smallest 128 megabytes FLC configurations. Even for the much more demanding LINPAC benchmark, the miss rate is still impressive. Now, even if you do not believe that these low miss rate numbers are good enough for supercomputing applications, we still can improve the miss rate by building an even bigger FLC. After all, 10 times smaller DRAM in supercomputers will still give us tens of gigabytes of FLC. And these numbers are for 128 megabytes to 512 megabytes. Finally, we can always make our future operating systems to be aware of the capability of FLC so that we can avoid most, in fact, practically most of the so potential sources of cache misses. And we have data to prove that it's possible to do so. Now, looking back in time, in 1981, Bill Gates, <laughs> I'll just, just do this for fun, uh, stated that 640 kilobytes would have been enough for any Maria's else need. Uh, Bill Gates would have been correct to state this if and only if FLC was invented at that time. The reason to this is because not until a much later time when the world have complex visual software interfaces that requires much more memory. Now, FLC is enabling technology also for IoTs. One of the reasons why smart watch has not, been, has not taken off yet is because it is impractical if it's not impossible to fit a full-blown operating system into a small space like a watch. So even if you could use five nanometer DRAMs and, okay, and pay for the money okay, for the cost of the DRAM, you still could not afford these short battery life of such a solution. By using FLC, we could now reduce the DRAM requirement for a smartwatch 
to 128 megabytes, and we can get the long battery life that we expect from a watch. Now, this leads me to a subject on how to get the maximum benefits of FLC. Instead of focusing on increasing the DRAM size, we could and should, from now on, focus on building a faster, higher bandwidth, and lower power DRAM. We could use embedded DRAM, of course, to build our FLC integrated with our SOC. But subject to the availability of embedded DRAMs, the next closest thing is to use what we already have. Uh, the first choice is to use ultra-wide IO2. Uh, second choice is LPDDR4. Both could give us tremendous bandwidth and low power. I'm confused if this is my glass or somebody else's glasses. Get another one. Uh, and the, the only problem is neither solutions are optimal for connecting the DRAM to, the, to, the, to our CPU. For that, we need the DRAM to be uh, the DRAM IO should be on one side of the die. Uh, the solution to this is actually quite simple. For the LPDDR4, our proposal is actually to cut, simply cut the LPDDR4 by half and stack them up to increase the overall bandwidth. Uh, if we just build a two gigabit die, each die to have two gigabits, stacking four dies will give us one gigabyte of total FLC capacity. Gigantic compared to the benchmark that I showed you earlier. Even for the 120 megabytes, we already achieved significant, significantly low, very significant, very, very low miss rate. <coughs> now, Now, uh, so why do I bring the subject of Mochi and FLC in the same talk? Well, as you can see from this slide, we can now build a very compact AP, AP stands for Application Processor, Mochi module by using Mochi Application Processor and FLC in the same package. And we can build this module in a very simple low pin count packaging thus allowing our customer to build system future systems much simpler and to be able to allow the cooling to be much simplified as well now alternatively we could use a half cut ultra wide io2 this gives us the edge interface similar to our half-cut LPDDR4 proposal. The main drawback is that if we need more FLC capacity, we just have to use TSV technology. But we're proposing this because we know that as TSP process matures, the cost will surely come down. Now, as you'll see from the next few slides, Mochi, by using Mochis and FLC, we could drastically simplify the way we build our computing devices. For example, in smartphones, all we need is an AP Mochi module, a modem Mochi, a Wi-Fi Mochi, and an SSD memory. Similarly, we could build our future laptops simply by adding a PC-centric Southbridge Mochi, housing the typical, the standards PCI, SATA, Gigabit Ethernet, Southbridge functionality. Now, of course, uh, higher-end higher -end, uh, uh, laptops could be built simply by replacing the AP Mochi module with higher performance uh, device. True reusability is a key advantage of Mochi. Simply by adding a, an Ethernet switch Mochi, we could build a VoIP phone. But the list of possible applications is almost endless. Customer could build their own companion Mochi Southbridge devices, or use FPGA Mochi from our partners 
as we are licensing our mochi technology to them. This will open up new market opportunities that we have not dreamt of yet. The dollar savings of FLCs are mind-boggling. Today's high-end smartphones regularly equipped with 3 gigabytes of main memory. A year ago, it was 2 gigabytes. Earlier in the stock, we already have 4 gigabytes of Exynos smartphone chip. Yet, even if on average, a smartphone, a 64-bit smartphone of the future, could only use only 1.5 gigabytes of main memory, by using FLC, we could at least save one gigabyte. Even bigger savings could be achieved in laptops, PCs, and you name it, servers. Yet even if we only save half of the last year DRAM revenues, this will still translate to $20 billion. The real savings to the end consumers will be even larger. In fact, 2x larger. Now, this is not all bad news for DRM companies. I always look at the positive side. First, with FLC, many new applications such as IoTs, the 50 billion interconnected devices that you see uh, they saw earlier, will surely emerge. Second, FLC technology will enable, enable DRM companies to sell a lot more of 3D NAND devices in all kinds of computing devices. It will also enable them to bring new memory technologies such as RAM to the market sooner because now these RAMs do not have to compete, at least do not have to directly compete to RAM. Now, GRAM companies just have to focus on building higher performance and lower power memories. And you bet they can do this. In summary, Mochi technology is key for us to move forward in face of the challenge, the increasing challenge of Moore's law. It's the only way for us to cost effectively build many application specific SOCs by building them into virtual system on chips. It allows us to manage our expenses in using the most advanced process nodes by limiting the number of chips that we have to build in these nodes. It will improve the time to market for us and also for our customers. It will reduce the risk of building many new products in, in, uh, uh, in the, new, the new nodes because we just have to deal with fewer devices. Now, FLC, on the other hand, is a different animal. It gives us tremendous cost savings for high-end devices. FLC will allow us to build, for example, the thinnest and the lowest cost Ultrabook, as we now can use much smaller battery, at least by 50%, much cheaper rotating HDD as final storage, because as you can see, we, still, we, all, we always have the SSD as our main memory to begin with, while achieving the same performance or even better than today's highest-end laptop using only SSD with lots of DRAM. At the extreme, at the other extreme, FLC could absolutely allow us to build the lowest-cost computing devices for the poorest parts of the world. FLC will make Nicholas Negraponte's dream to be a reality. Without his passion, I would probably would never have thought about the possibility of building computers for $100. And might never even eventually figure out how to develop FLC technology so that we can build these devices for much less than his original target price. FLC will allow us to build supercomputers of the future with multi terabytes of main memory at a fraction of today's cost. FLC based supercomputers will easily handle truly massive 
big data structures, the kind of data structures that we haven't even thought about yet, because it's not possible to build computers with such, with multi terabytes of DRAMs. We can soon build computers with tens of thousands of processors in a space of one foot by one foot cube, replacing racks of racks of super of computers that normally fit in a warehouse. Finally, FLC would enable all computers to use less than half the energy they are using today. Assuming conservatively that all computers and data centers consume 5%, some estimates say 10%, but just using 5% of the world energy by using FLC, we will soon be able to reduce these energy, energy consumptions to only 2.5%. Yes, it is a small percentage of saving, but it is the right direction of our goal of reducing the CO2 emission. Now, that is all what I have to say today. This is very early in stage for our development. Our first prototype of this technology should be ready by year end. Uh, stay tuned, and thank you.